All right, I think it's time to get started. This clock is like wrong, but not in the, not in a simple way. Um, I uh, welcome back. I hope you had a good break. Um, this is theory of computation. My name is Chris Stecker, and I am happy to be here today and for the semester. This I really uh, I really like this class. Um, I don't say that about all my classes, um, and I really like all of you too. Now, I don't know most of you, but I'm glad to uh, I'm glad to get to know you a little bit. Um, theory of computation, and I um, I handed out the syllabus. Everybody got one. There's several several things are wrong on the syllabus, which I um, I'm sorry about that. I didn't notice before printing. Um, most importantly, our class meetings are uh, 9:30 to 10:20, and then on Wednesdays it's 9 to 9:50, not 10 to. 10.50, so sorry about that. Come here tomorrow at 9. I don't know why we're here, by the way. Um, you know, my classes are usually in, in Bano, so I hope it's probably more annoying to me than the rest of you, because I usually don't leave the building. Um, I left the building. And then uh, also on the syllabus, you can see my office hours listed there. Those, this is not correct, because that's during our class. So. Um, I will, uh, I actually don't remember what I decided my office hours were going to be, so I will, um, I will update you tomorrow about that. Sorry about that. Um, I am, uh, uh, I'm wearing my mask today. It's because my, one of my kids has COVID right now, so usually I'm not going to wear it. I'm sorry if you have a hard time understanding me. I hope that it's all right. And I'm going to try to do everything on the screen here. I know it's kind of small i hope that everybody uh, in the back can see there's another one back there that you can always turn around and look at if you really um, are having a hard time seeing this this one in the front um the reason i do that is because i like to record all of the uh classes that i do so i'm uh i'm recording what you see here and also you know the, the audio of my voice and then after class every day i'm going to post it on youtube so you can if you miss class or if you like you know don't understand something after the fact, you want to go back and watch it again, uh, you can do that. So I hope that that is convenient for you all. Be sure to like and subscribe. Um, you can see on here is a, a QR code for the class website. That, this one is, 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 uh, is accurate. So go there. This is where I'm going to post links to all of these videos if you want to watch them after the fact. I'm also going, like what I'm writing right here, I am going to save as a PDF. Uh, and post it on there also. So if you don't want to watch the whole video, you can always just look at the, um, the notes that I wrote. Um, this is to, uh, to make it sort of as, as uh, smooth as possible for you all if you have to miss class or if your notes are not good for, uh, at a particular point and you want to go back and look at it. I hope that that is useful. Um, when I uh, decided to do this, I was worried that maybe, maybe nobody's going to come to class if I uh, uh, allow you to access this stuff after the fact. Um, I hope that you still come to class. I, don't know. It's, I think it's still worth coming to class, but um, check it out if you're interested. You can see on the syllabus it says the textbook is this one right here, formal language. Maybe that's why they put me in this building because it sounds like an English textbook or something. It is not. Um, formal language, a practical introduction by Weber. Uh, it should be uh, not too expensive. Uh, and I'll tell you, you didn't hear it from me, but actually this book is fairly easy to, um, to find online but, you know, from shady sources. So if you, are, if you are a shady kind of person and you want to do it that way, um, it is possible. I'm just saying. All right. Any, uh, any questions about the book? The book we are not going to, I'm not going to like give you reading assignments. Uh, we will mostly use it for, uh, that's where most of the homework will be taken out of the, the book homework assignments. All right, great. Uh, let's just look briefly over the syllabus here. Um, I think I already highlighted all the things that are wrong. The final exam time is there, May 9th, 8 a.m. Sorry for the early time, but um, that I have double checked and that's, the, that's when the final exam is. So be there, put it on your calculator. Uh, let's just look at the course description. This is the official course description on the books. It says, this course explores what computers can and can't do by examining simple mathematical models of computation. Topics include finite state machines, regular expressions, non-determinism, push-down automata, context-free grammars, and Turing machines. We will see that there are limits to what computers can do. 
And in doing so, we will learn about what a computer really is. You may be surprised. Uh, I didn't write this text. This is the official text uh, description of the course. But uh, yeah, it's, that's pretty accurate. I think you know um, this course is about computation as a theoretical idea. So it is, uh, you could say this is a course about computers and computation, but it's not about specific computers, not even about specific programming languages. So I, like, I will often refer, make, a, make a mention the fact that real life computers do exist and real life programming languages exist. Um, but we're not actually going to talk about any specific computers or specific programming languages. What we're going to talk about is more the idea of a machine for computing in, in, uh, as an abstract idea. And um, one of the interesting things about this is the last sentence there. We will see that there are limits to what computers can do. Uh, I mean limits not like your computer is, is old so you can't like print anymore or something like that. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean like there are actually theoretical limitations to just the idea of a machine for computing. Actually, computers are not capable of doing anything, uh, of doing everything, right? And I don't mean like, you know, can you ever really teach a computer how to love? Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean like there are actual sort of mathematical capabilities that a computer can have, and there are certain mathematical capabilities that no computer can have. This is a true fact, and that's, this is um, stuff that we're gonna be talking about throughout the semester. It's like really what, um, what kinds of things is a computer capable of and what is a computer not capable of? Uh, not talking about specific computers, just abstractly any kind of machine for computing. So that's what the class is about. I hope that that sounds interesting to you. It's a, it's a very interesting topic in my opinion. So I hope that'll come across. Anyway, let's, uh, let's just go through the, the details here. There's not, I don't have a lot to say about this and then we'll get into the real business. Uh, we're going to have two midterms that will be during our ordinary class time on uh, February 24 and March 24. Those are two Fridays, so put those on your calendar. Uh, no calculators or computers or whatever on the tests. Th this is not that kind of class. You, you would not want to use a calculator. Um, it says the two midterms will be weighted equally in your course grade, and the final exam will be weighted double. The final exam will be cumulative, but the midterms will not be. So that's just sort of technicalities. You will ask me again when the uh, second midterm comes. Is this cumulative? I will say no. The final exam will be, but not the second midterm. All right. There's going to be homework every week. And um, the assignments, like I said, will be from the textbook. I'm going to post them on the class website. So you want to go to this, uh, this code there. And that's where you will find the homework assignments. It's not on Blackboard because I don't like using Blackboard. I just write the, the uh, web pages myself. Um, check it out. It says students are encouraged to work together on assignments, but each must hand in their own paper. So that's totally fine with me if you want to work with your friends. I'm not going to try to uh, be a detective about who, which one of you actually came up with the answers or whatever. Uh, the homework is going to be due each Wednesday night at midnight, uh, and the assignments cover the material from the previous week. So the idea is we do stuff, you know, Tuesday through Friday of one week. And that material you have until Wednesday of the following week to do the homework about. All right, the homeworks I'm gonna um, I'm going to have you submit them on GradeScope, which is uh, an electronic sort of homework submitting thing. I hope that you've used that before. It's very easy to use. You uh, write all of your stuff by hand on paper, like you would for an ordinary math class, and then you just uh, take pictures with your phone, send them into to GradeScope. It's easy, and it works pretty well, I think. All right, it says late homeworks without excuse will lose one-third credit for each calendar day that it's late. Uh, that's the rule. Let me know, you know, if you, uh, if you, have, uh, if you have reasons, let me know your reasons. Um, but uh, without reasons, that's what happens. All right, any questions about homework assignments? Great. And there's going to be quizzes uh, each Friday. At the beginning of each class, a short quiz will be given covering that week's material. That is the stuff that was on the homework on Wednesday. You know, I said um, you can work together with your friends on the homework. Uh, the quizzes are really meant to make sure that like you yourself actually understand what you were doing on the homework rather than just copying off of your friends. Like I said, I'm not really gonna try to um, 
I'm not going to try to sleuth out if you are copying it off of your friends. If you copy all your homeworks off of your friends, you might do okay on the homework, but you will fail all the quizzes and the exams, and it will not go well for you. So this is, this is the, the real purpose of the quizzes. All right. Uh, it says the quiz questions are meant to be similar to the easier textbook questions, um, and uh, no calculators on the quizzes. The idea is uh, we'll come in on Friday, and um, this is not meant to be like a big stressful thing. If you did the homework and everything on the homework made sense to you, then you should do fine on the quiz. The quiz usually will have two questions. We'll take like 10 minutes to do it, and then we'll just go on with the rest of class. So it is not meant to be a big deal. Uh, I mean, I know these things are stressful anyway, but my, my intention is that this is not meant to be a big deal. It's just meant to make sure that you're actually keeping up on your own with the material from week to week. All right. I hope that sounds okay to everybody. Um, as for the grading, so your grade is made up of homework, quizzes, and exams, and this is, a, this is a cute little thing. I would like for you all to decide what percentages each of those three categories make in your grade. Um, so think about, you know, these are three very different ways of evaluating your understanding. Uh, the homework you have basically unlimited time to do, um, but the questions are a little harder. The quiz questions are meant to be a little easier, but it, it, there is some, some amount of time pressure. And then the exams, of course, are, are timed and all that. So think about um, what you think is going to be the best, uh, you know, evaluation of your true skills. I know some people, like, are bad at taking tests or whatever, so you can weigh the test lower if you want to. Uh, the rules are the three percentages have to add up to 100. The, uh, each of the three categories has to be at least 30%, so you can't just say, like, 0% for the exams. Um, and then you can't change your mind later. So I say sometime on or before February 4th, you should tell me what you want your three categories to be. That's, um, I'll give you a few weeks just so that you'll, uh, you'll get to see sort of how hard the homeworks are, what, how, how the quizzes go for you, et cetera. This, that is before the first exam, so you won't have an exam before that. All right, any thoughts about that? I hope that that sounds like a fun little thing to do. So just email me what you want your percentages to be. And it says at the end there, if you never notify the professor, you will default to exactly 33% for each category. This is some, uh, some often um, I have people who just never tell me. And I, I'm not trying to like screw you by, um, by uh, making you forget. I'm gonna remind you, but sometimes people just like, nah, I don't wanna tell them. Uh, if you don't tell me, I will default you to 33%, which only adds up to 99%. I'm gonna screw you out at one point just because you didn't tell me. Um, you got to tell me. Last semester, I said to somebody, like, you know, the day after, I said, hey, you never told me. If you don't tell me, I'm going to default you to 33%. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> no, man. Give me, take 33 and a third. But that's all right. I gave them the 33%. Um, all right. And I think this is about all that we need to go over here. There's a little note about office hours. That is just saying that I hope that you will feel comfortable talking to me in office hours outside of class. This is part, uh, in my opinion, this is part of uh, the way that this course and all your courses really are supposed to go is that there will be some, you know, hard homework questions or whatever. And I look forward to chatting on an individual level with some of you. Certainly not required. You don't have to talk to me if you don't want to, but uh, you know that is uh, that's part of what I like to do is to talk to people. So I hope you feel uh, feel free to do that. All of my office hours will be you know in my office in Bano or um, or on Zoom if you prefer. If if you are far away and you don't want to go over there, um, I will uh, turn my Zoom thing on and we can meet that way if you like. All right. And I think that's all I needed to say. A uh, little note there about attendance. Uh, you know, attendance is not part of your grade, but um, and I try to make it easy for you. If you have to miss class for whatever reason, um, you should be able to follow along just fine. What that means is, uh, if you are missing class, um, say if you miss class on a Wednesday, I still expect you to submit your homework. You're not going to submit during class anyway, so um, don't tell me you didn't do the homework because you weren't in class. That that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, if you miss a quiz. It is, um, you know, if you have good reasons to miss a quiz, then we can talk about it. But uh, I consider that your responsibility to, um, to initiate such conversations. If you miss a quiz and just don't, don't mention it, I'm not going to mention it either. 
That's not because um, I give you 100 on it. It's because I, I gave you a zero on it. So uh, please mention it. I am happy to talk about it. I'm not trying to be a tough guy. I just don't want to get involved with chasing after you if you are not coming to class. All right. And there's one last little note about counseling services. Did you know there are free counseling services available? This is, uh, this is remarkable. In these great United States of America, uh, free, free health care of any kind is, uh, is hard to come by. So uh, check it out if you're interested. I have found um, such things. I don't get free counseling, but um, you know it's helpful. So check it out if you're interested. I think that's all I needed to say about the syllabus. Anybody have any questions about that? I hope that's all fairly clear. All right, great. I think we can get right down to it then. Let's talk a little bit about the theory of computation. I wanted, for today, I wanted to give sort of a, a little historical overview about where the subject comes from, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start with some details, although the details that we get to today are, are all fairly uh, Simple, not, not terribly hardcore, mathematically speaking, just yet, because there's a bit, of, uh, a bit of introduction that we need to get through. All right, this is theory of computation. So, um, like I said before, this is a course about the idea of computing machines and what they are capable of and not capable of. Um, interesting fact, maybe, I don't know how true this is. I don't know exactly your backgrounds. I, I believe you're all math or computer science majors, computer engineering, something like that. Um, probably the mathematics that we do in this course are the newest mathematics that you have ever learned. I don't know if you ever thought about the fact that like when you learn math as a kid, you are learning stuff that is very, very old. Um, and I'm not sure, do any of you know any 20th century mathematics? I don't know if you've ever thought about this. 21st century mathematics? I don't know, does anyone have, uh, nothing comes to my mind actually. I don't know exactly what you all know, but um, uh, it's hard to come by um, like by the time you get to the 20th century, already mathematics was super developed and extremely technical. And that kind of stuff, even from like 100 years ago from now, is not really the kind of stuff that um, is typically taught even to college students. But uh, the theory of computation is basically all 20th century mathematics. And so this, uh, this may be the most cutting edge, at, at least in terms of new mathematics that you've ever um, that you've ever experienced all right and so i'm going to try to sort of tell the the story of the history of the subject here um i'm going to say around the uh the beginning of the 20th century around the year 1900 um people started sort of thinking seriously about um what we now call algorithms thinking seriously about algorithms. The word um, algorithm actually is a very old word. Um, the, uh, the, uh, what it means, or to, to modern people, what this means, al algorithm, this means sort of a specific procedure, procedure for solving a problem or answering a question or something like that in finitely many steps. It is some kind of formalized description of a procedure that you can apply, which will eventually uh, lead to a solution of whatever problem you're trying to solve. Uh, nowadays, when people say the word algorithm, they are often referring to a computer program, like when we talk about you know, the, the Twitter algorithm or the YouTube algorithm is, is a computer program that somehow decides what videos to show you on YouTube or whatever. But um, more generally, the word algorithm just refers to any kind of specific procedure for solving a problem which, um, which terminates after finally many steps, all right? And um, the word algorithm is actually very old. It comes from, um, anybody uh, know the, the word algorithm, where that comes from? This is an interesting historical fact. This is actually named after a person. It's, uh, it's from this guy's name. 
Al-Khwarizmi. This is um, one of the greats of the uh, Arab mathematicians. Uh, I believe Al-Khwarizmi lived around the year 800, I think, something like that. So I'm not an expert on the history here, but lived um, in, the, uh, in the region of Baghdad, which at the time was like the capital of, uh, of sort of math and sciences in, uh, in, in the Euro Europe and Asia. Uh, Baghdad was where it's at. And um, Al-Khwarizmi uh, was, um, I never heard of Al-Khwarizmi when I was a kid. I don't know if, if you have, have heard about him, but by any account, one of the all-time great uh, mathematicians, scientists in history. Um, I think I never heard of him because I was taught by the whites in New England. But um, it, if, you, if you learn mathematics elsewhere in the world as a kid, you know about Al-Khwarizmi. And probably his greatest um, contribution that, that people are familiar with today is, you know how like when you add up numbers, you go like 127 plus 55, you go like this, and you go like this, and you carry the one there, and that's an eight. I think I did that right. You ever seen that before? Yes, that's Al Khwarizmi. He he like invented that. Um, this actually, historically speaking, it's not entirely clear that Al Khwarizmi personally came up with this, but he was the first person to write a a book which explained how to add numbers like this. This is like, I don't know. When I talk to people, you know, in the club about mathematics, I, I find that most people think that somehow like human beings were were born on this earth with the knowledge of how to do that. But it's not so at all. Somebody had to come up with that. And I don't know, to me it's remarkable that like, yeah, somebody did come up with that. And in fact, we know his name and it's a guy that I've never heard of before. That's ridiculous in my opinion. But anyway, um, this is, uh, is Al Khwarizmi. Also, he also did many other super important things. Um, and this is where the word algorithm comes from. So when, when Al Khwarizmi came up with this, it was, this kind of thing was unknown in Europe for many centuries after it was known in the Middle East. And um, when, when this technique was eventually introduced into Europe, you know, around like the year 13, 1400s, um, it was referred to as Al Khwarizmi's method. They're like, oh, you, well, how do you do this? Basically, before, before Al Khwarizmi's method, in Europe, it was believed that this was simply impossible to do without an abacus or something like that. Like you, you basically they said like, nah, nah, you got to use a calculator if you want to do that. And um, but then people realized, oh no, there's this thing called Al Khwarizmi's method. And um, over the over the centuries, this referring to this as Al Khwarizmi, it, it eventually turned into this word algorithm, which now means any method for doing any kind of procedure in um, in specific steps, all right? Al Khwarizmi also is regarded as the, the father of algebra. The word algebra also comes from an Arabic uh, word that he didn't invent, but he was the first person to use this word in a mathematical context. Uh, this, like al, I don't know Arabic, but this means something like the in Arabic, I believe. And um, algebra, it, it means uh, this, you know, it, it's written more like this is the original way of writing that that word and it means something like the balancing um, Al Khwarizmi invented the idea of adding the same things to both sides of an equation which is another like very fundamental thing um, which he called like this is the the balancing operation and that's where the, the word algebra comes from anyway one of the all-time greats um, what I was saying, though, is around the beginning of the 20th century, people started thinking about algorithms, and in particular, um, this, this idea of what an algorithm is, all right? This, can I just say, that actually, if you want to think very seriously mathematically about an algorithm, that what I wrote there is not really a... Um, a legitimate mathematical definition of a mathematical concept. Just because I'm using lots of informal words here. Um, for instance, what exactly do I mean when I say a procedure? Like what specifically counts as a procedure? And then what counts as um, solving a problem and what counts as like steps in a procedure, all right? And you can even ask that. Like if I, if I look at this problem here, um, how many steps did I do when I was doing this computation? The answer is like, well, I, 
I suppose it, it kind of depends exactly what counts as a step. Like the, all of these things, uh, I hope that you have some idea of what I mean when I say this, but this is not a real mathematical definition of, of a thing, right? This is, a, uh, this is an informal concept, all right? Um, at the time, in the beginning, uh, you know, 1900s, this was the time, uh, not hundreds, I mean like actually around the year 1900 was when all of math was um, being formalized using set theory. This is a major kind of change in the way that we talk about mathematics. Before around 1900, um, there were a lot of kind of isolated disciplines of mathematics. There were people doing calculus, people doing algebra, people doing uh, set theory. But uh, around the beginning of the 20th century, everything in mathematics became part of set theory. And that's how we view math nowadays. And you know, as you learn math, um, you learn things in terms of sets and set theory. Um, one thing that nobody knew how to do at this time, no set theory description of what an algorithm is. And this was regarded as a bit of a problem, theoretically speaking, because if you want to ask questions like, um, can there be some algorithm to solve this particular problem? Uh, how do you even know if you found a real algorithm or not, if you don't have a real definition for what a real algorithm is, all right? There was no description of what an algorithm is in terms of mathematics, in terms of set theory, all right? And this is um, the, this kind of problem, it wasn't a problem in the sense of like, we don't know what the answer is, we have to figure out the answer to some equation or whatever. It was a problem in the sense that nobody even knew what, what are we even talking about when we talk about algorithms in a very specific way. And this was the, uh, the setting in which Turing began his influential work. So Alan Turing is now regarded as sort of like the father of, of computation in some sense. Um, the, uh, this was his, uh, his birth and death dates, 1912 to 1954. Um, Turing's big idea was to come up with an actual definition of what an algorithm is. What do you actually mean by a procedure or whatever? Turing decided that his big idea was an algorithm is any process that in theory could be mechanized. This was Turing's big idea, that what we consider to be an algorithm, um, an unambiguous description of certain steps, his idea was if you had such an algorithm, if you had a description of a procedure, then you should be able to create a machine to do this procedure for you. And that's what an algorithm is, is something which could, in theory, be done by a machine. Any process that could be mechanized. And now, this is not any better in terms of describing in the, in the language of set theory. But what Turing did was um, Turing uh, described very specifically in terms of set theory the capabilities of such a machine that could perform, perform these algorithms. So Turing described very specifically using set theory the uh, capabilities of the machine that he was talking about. All right. And uh, Turing referred to this, but nowadays we call this, this abstract idea, we call it the Turing machine. But it, in, you know, Turing, it's not cool to name stuff after yourself as a mathematician. Um, Turing called this, this he called the universal machine. And this is probably one of the great ideas of the 20th century, maybe, uh, 
I mean, I don't know. I haven't tried to make my all-time ranking of best ideas ever, but um, Turing had this idea that there could be a single machine which, in theory, could compute whatever you wanted, all right? Um, at the time, of course, there were actual computing machines in the world, thing, mechanical uh, calculators, things with gears and cranks on them that would add numbers, multiply numbers. Um, but this is not what Turing had in mind. Turing had in mind, see, the difference is those calculating machines were specifically built for a single purpose, which was like adding numbers or multiplying numbers or whatever. Um, Turing had this concept that there could in theory be a general purpose machine which had no specific use intended, but its whole purpose is that it can do anything. Um, and that is basically what a computer is now. Like the, the whole work of the rest of the 20th century in creating usable computers that everybody carries around with them all the time um, is a realization of Turing's basic concept that there should be a machine which has no specific purpose, but its power is that it can, in theory, be repurposed to do whatever you want. That's what a computer is. Um, sometimes I imagine, what, what would it be like to describe to someone from the deep past what a computer is supposed to do? And uh, it's hard to say what, like, I can say, like, oh, I can read my tweets on it, or I can, I can text my kids, I can send somebody um, an email. I think that is understandable, and they'd be like, oh, okay, so this is like some kind of fancy post office or something. And I would want to say, like, well, yes, that's, that's what I use it for, but the, what's good about it is really that that's not the only thing it can do. It can do many, many other things, and in fact, it can do anything you can imagine. You, if, if you can imagine it, you can make a computer to do it, more or less. Um, this is the idea of the universal machine, and he, he sort of published this concept in a very influential paper in 1936. Turing himself, it was not really his intention to, to build a universal machine. Um, what these, the, you know, like my phone is basically a universal Turing machine. Um, although my uh, Apple iPhone is locked down, I'm not allowed to reprogram my own iPhone. But the, uh, the concept of the universal machine is that in, um, it is reprogrammable by the uh, by anybody to do whatever you want, all right? Um, his idea, though, that, that machines are the proper way to think about algorithms really um, was the inspiration for people in the following decades to actually create these kinds of machines. And uh, for this reason, Turing is often called you know, the father of the computer or the father of computer science. I think that's more, more accurate. Turing didn't actually make uh, universal computing machines, but he inspired the ideas behind all of that. All right, so anyway, what we want to talk about here is um, we will discuss eventually, not today, but um, what kinds of things can be computed by uh, physical machines. I keep on saying the point of the universal machine is that it can do anything. But I also said earlier uh, today, actually there are limitations, theoretical limitations to what a computing machine can do. So Turing did call this the universal machine um, and we still describe it in that way. But actually it's not truly universal. There are specific kinds of things that no physical computing instrument can compute. And this is something that's really very, uh, very interesting. This we're going to get to towards the end of the class. What kinds of things can be computed by physical machines? I'm just going to say not everything. And I mean, I don't mean some sort of silly examples. I mean, there are actual like mathematical functions that no computer, no, uh, no physical computer can compute. And we're going to talk about those things. Um, this to me is deeply, uh, deep, deeply deep. I shouldn't have said deeply. I'm, this to me is deep. Um, if you think about, uh, I, I don't know if you, if you like to have sort of deep thoughts about these sorts of things, but um, it is a fact that there are certain things that a, uh, a physical 
computing instrument cannot ever compute. Um, this is deep in my opinion just because it makes me think about myself, like myself as a computing instrument. I think of, for instance, like a human brain is basically some kind of computing instrument. Like it, a, a human brain is a physical object, I believe that. Um, and probably uh, the human brain is a, is a machine, you know, like, like a computer, I guess, in some way. Um, what, this, what all of this means to me is that um, the limitations that exist for, uh, for something like a physical computer, those same limitations um, also exist of, of human brains. And what, what that means to me is that there are certain mathematical questions which simply cannot be answered by a computer or by a person or by anything, right? Um, there are basic limitations somehow baked into the universe. Uh, there are questions which cannot be answered by any kind of um, algorithmic process. And this apparently would include how whatever mechanism our brains work by, all right? This is, this is very interesting to me. Um, that's a little preview of, of what's going to happen uh, later on. What kinds of things can be computed by physical machines? This is deep. I would say this is about me too, right? I mean, whatever, whatever limitations exist of a physical computer, I think probably, I mean, I don't understand how a human brain works, but I do, I do believe that it is a, a physical object, you know? If you hit my brain with a hammer, you will break it. Um, these, these are very interesting things to me. I don't know if that sounds interesting to you or not. If you don't want to think deep thoughts, you can just focus on the mathematics. That's, that's also uh, interesting. All right. Any thoughts so far? By the way, I hope that you will feel free to interrupt me and, uh, with questions or, or whatever. Once we get down to some you know, more traditional looking mathematics, I will, of course, um, let you guys work on problems. I don't intend to sit here and just talk the whole time, but uh, for the history, that's all I can do. All right, great. Let's get down to some details. I think we got 13 minutes remaining. So let's, uh, let's just start, start at the beginning. Like I said, these, um, the, uh, the details here, uh, at least at the beginning, are gonna be very, uh, very simple. We have to have a bunch of terminologies just to make sure that we all know what we're talking about, but nothing, uh, nothing too fancy. So I wanna talk about languages, all right? The textbook here is, you know, the title of the book is Formal Language. And um, really, uh, there, are, there are kind of two parallel ways that you can view the entire subject. You can think of everything in terms of machines, which is kind of the way that I was describing it a moment ago. Uh, or there's an equivalent way of thinking about the whole subject in terms of what we call languages, which you can think of kind of like computer languages, like Python or whatever, but... Uh, the, the analogy is not so clean. Um, so let's, uh, let me just tell you what I mean by languages. So here's some basic terminology here. Basic terms. Um, first of all, an alphabet. A language is made of strings that are taken from an alphabet. That's basically what I'm gonna say over the next few minutes. An alphabet is any kind of uh, finite set Everything I have to define in terms of sets, right? It's a finite set of symbols. You know, like uh, the typical alphabet that we are going to use is this, A, B, C, et cetera, maybe down to Z. We probably won't go all the way to Z. Usually we, uh, if you think of these as like variable names, you don't actually use all of them. But anyway, that's a, that's a standard alphabet that you could use to define a language. Um, the alphabet that we typically use includes all of those, but also like uppercase letters and maybe some, some other symbols you want, might want to include in your alphabet, whatever. Uh, or maybe 0, 1 is another alphabet which we are often going to use. That's the binary alphabet, um, which is like uh, probably you know, uh, at a certain very fundamental level, everything that your computer does is based on just 0 and 1. Um, or something like, uh, if you know something about 
computer implementations of strings or um, the ASCII system or the Unicode specification. These are specific, uh, we would call them alphabets, which can be used in, uh, in text files in your computer. Um, so these are all different alphabets. It just has to be a finite set of symbols. It's not allowed to be infinite. All of these things, you know, the Unicode specification has many, many characters in it, uh, in all kinds of different languages, whatever, but it is still finite. There's not infinitely many. All right. Um, usually our alphabet, we're going to call, we use a variable. Usually our alphabet is called uh, capital sigma. All right. Is what we're going to use to represent the alphabet. All right. And then a language is built up of strings from the alphabet. So a string, this is something, this means what you think it means. If you know, you know, a string in Python or whatever, a string is a finite sequence of uh, symbols from the alphabet. That's called a string, all right? So for, um, if my alphabet is something like, if my alphabet is just zero, one, then strings look like, uh, I said a sequence, usually in math we write a sequence like with commas, but I'm not gonna write the comma. So it, it would look something like this, you know, that's a string, right? Or something like one, 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 or something like just zero by itself, that counts as a string. All right, these are strings. The word string is kind of like universally used in programming languages, although, I don't, does anyone know where this word comes from? I don't, I have never really liked the word string. I, I learned some programming when I, was, when I was a kid, and even then I didn't like the word string. To me, like a string has the connotation of something that is sort of long and wiggly. These, you could say these are kind of long, but they're not wiggly at all. They're, that's what I don't like. And a string, like you can, you can tie the ends to the start of a string, like a, I mean a real string. You can't do that with the strings. I don't know. This is my, my gripe with computer science as a profession. I don't know, I have a better idea. I just don't like, I don't like the word string. Um, okay, uh, a little, just a notation here. We're going to use like absolute value signs. This means the length of the string. So if I said like that is four, right? The length of a string we're going to represent using the absolute value signs. It just means how many letters are part of the string. All right. Uh, one very important string that we are going to refer to all the time is um, the string of zero symbols. That's called the empty string. So this does count as a string, the string of no characters is the empty string. And actually the empty string like is not terribly useful for anything, but it comes up all the time when you're trying to do mathematics of computation. It's similar to like the number zero, which kind of means nothing. And so it sounds like a stupid idea, but it really is super important if you want to do math with numbers. So uh, the empty string, and we write it as like that, a lowercase epsilon is the empty string. All right. This is something that is, is occasionally slightly confusing. This little epsilon is not one of the letters in the alphabet, right? Like in these examples here, the alphabet is just zero and one, all right? Um, this little guy here is not a letter from the alphabet. It is just a variable that represents a string which has no letters in it, all right? So can I just say the epsilon is not an alphabet symbol It represents the empty string. All right. In particular, there's no such thing as epsilon epsilon as like a string of epsilons. You 
that doesn't really mean anything. Because epsilon is not a letter in the alphabet, it's just a thing which represents the empty string. All right, we got five more minutes left. What else can we talk about? This is more very simple things here. So usually we use, um, you know, like I said, we are going to use zeros and ones, but usually in this class we'll use things like A, B, C for alphabet letters and things like X, Y, Z for strings. So generally, X, things like X, Y, Z uh, are like variables which represent a big string. Whereas, uh, and those strings will be made up of individual letters, which are like A, B, C. Um, usually, this is not uh, confusing. All right, and um, there is one basic operation that you can do with two strings to combine them together. And it's called the concatenation. We can concatenate two strings. That just means you, you stick the two strings together one after the other. So um, if uh, x was 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and y is 1, 1, 1, then the concatenation just means x followed immediately by y. I believe in Python, if you have two strings, you, you concatenate using the plus sign. Am I right? I'm not a Python expert, although I, I use Python every so often in my real life. But I, it's like infrequently enough that I always have to look stuff up uh, to remember how to do it. But anyway, um, in this class, when we concatenate, I'm just going to write it. Just you just write the things. There's no operation. There's no. We don't use plus for string concatenation. It's just x y. And in this example, it would be zero zero one one zero one one one. You just take like that's x and that's y. So when I when I have two strings and I write you know x as if it was like x times y that just means you follow one after another, and this you know y x would be one 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 zero zero one one zero right, that's different x y is different from y x so there is no um, that is to say string concatenation is not commutative right, which is why actually I don't really like in Python that they use the plus sign because I feel like mathematically speaking the plus sign has a connotation of being commutative when it in, in uh, string concatenation is not commutative. I don't mean to just complain about programming all the time. I like programming a lot. Um, it's not commutative, but we can also write things like, so we will do something like x squared. That means x, x, which means what you think it means. So in, in this particular example, x squared would be, well, can I just say it would be x x right, which is zero zero one one zero 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 one one zero. If if uh, I'm using the same x from before, all right. You can do x cubed also, etc. Any finite power, finite whole number power of x will work. It has to be positive though. So let me just say there's no there's no such thing as x inverse in this setting, um, just because x inverse would be like something which you could multiply to cancel all the letters from x, but there's no cancellation in a string. They, they just go next to each other. They don't, they don't recombine or anything like that. You can't simplify a string. It's just what it is. All right? And we got two minutes. I'll just give you our last bit of simple terminology. And this we will talk more at length next time. A language. So we have talked so far about what an alphabet is. It's just like an alphabet. What do I mean when I say a language is a, a set, possibly an infinite set, of strings from some alphabet? This is not a terribly interesting definition. A language is just a specific set of strings using some alphabet. So you could say like, this is, all this terminology is by analogy with actual like real world languages. Like you could say, what is the English language really? From this point of view, you would say the English language is the set of all the words that you can make that are like real actual words. And there are certain things in English which are real words and some things are not real words. So the set, of the English language would just be the set of all the like actual real words in English. All right. This is what a language is. So, for example, can I just give a one very quick example? So, for um, if my alphabet is say zero one, 
this is a language. I could say it's just any set of strings using that alphabet. So how about this? That is a language, all right? This would be, I could describe this in words as the language of all strings of length one or two, right? That is what we call a language. More often, we would write languages as something like, um, you know, here's another one. This would be the language of all strings which begin with a zero, then have a bunch of ones, and then end with another zero, right? I hope you're, you're hip with my set theory notation here. This means the set of all things that have this format, which is it begins with a zero, then it has a lot of ones, then it ends with a zero, where this n here can be any natural number, that is uh, numbers one, two, three, uh, starting with zero in this class, zero, one, two, three, et cetera, all right? And I think our time is up. Thank you for your attention. We will talk much more about languages next time around. Please let me know on your way out if you have any questions about anything. I would be happy to.